Hello everyone, welcome once again to Relay Tutorials that is relevant, easy learning, accessible to you. And today we are going to continue our series on ovarian cyst. As I mentioned earlier in my video that it varies in different age groups and we have learned about its presentation and management in premenopausal age group and today we will focus on young children and adolescents. Ovarian cysts are seen in girls and women of all ages. In children and in adolescents, they commonly present either during the neonatal period with peak incidence in the first year of life or around the time of menarche. Most cysts are benign and will resolve spontaneously. That's a good point. They can present with pain but usually are an incidental finding. They are the most common cause of abdominal cysts in female fetuses and neonates, usually presenting in the third trimester. As in when they are still in utero, you can see these cysts. Most of them are unilateral and simple in nature and can be of varying size. The cause is usually fetal gonadotrophins, maternal estrogen or placental human chorionic gonadotrophin stimulations. Most ovarian cysts in children and adolescents are benign in nature, right? With 60% being functional or also called a simple cyst. Here, the ovarian follicles fail to involute and mature into the corpus luteum. Of the complex benign cysts, germ cell tumors are the most common in children and adolescents. Of these, 55-70% to 70 are mature cystic teratomas, commonly known as dermoid cysts usually occur between the ages of 6 and 15 years and 10% of these dermoids can be bilateral. So there is a simple classification. One is benign, which like majority of them are, also called a simple cyst. Secondly, we have complex cyst, wherein we have mature cystic teratomas, endometriomas, gonadoblastoma, mucinous or cyst adenofibroma, ovarian torsions, some tube ovarian abscess, paratubal cyst and paraovarian cyst. But there can be malignant cyst also, somewhere around 4 to 16 percent. And when, whenever we think of malignant uh, tumors, the classification is easy to remember if you know the normal anatomy or the normal histology of ovary. So there can be six cord stromal tumors, there can be germ cell tumors and there can be these epithelial tumors arising from the epithelial lining of an ovary. So epithelial tumors can be serous or mucinous adenocarcinomas. The benign ones were just adenomas and when we are talking about malignant, they are going to be adenocarcinomas. Sertoli or Leddick cell tumors, germ cell tumors, dysgerminoma, yolk sac tumors, embryonal carcinoma, polyembryoma. So uh, this is one way of uh, kind of remembering them. How do they usually present? They occur between the ages of 16 and 15 years and 10% may be bilateral. They are usually asymptomatic and are discovered incidentally on ultrasound scan. This is something you are going to find in all age groups. Ovarian cysts generally do not present with any severe complaints unless they you know really grow in size or they have some secondary complications like torsion and hemorrhage they are generally discovered incidentally on an ultrasound scan 15 percent of dermoises can present with abdominal pain and torsion sometimes spontaneous rupture may occur in less than one percent of patients and even malignant transformation is reported in approximately 1-2% to of patients. Gonadoblastoma, it is a C, look at the word gonadoblastoma. So it's a mixed germ cell tumor that characteristically develops in gonadal dysgenesis when there is presence of a Y chromosome. Although benign, it can evolve into a dysgerminoma with malignant features. Almost half of malignant ovarian tumors in children and adolescents are juvenile granulosa cell tumors. These usually are solid tumors and are the most common form of sex called stromal tumors. Half of them are diagnosed between the age of 6 and 13 years and one third are diagnosed at slightly uh, 
uh, higher age group 14 and 19 years. The most common presenting complaints are abdominal pain and distension with 30% of patients presenting with pain. There is a reported incidence of ovarian torsion which occurs in around 7 to 10% of ovariances diagnosed in children and adolescents. Now, whenever a patient, you know, whenever these young kids present to you with pain, there has to be a differential diagnosis going on in, in your brain. You have to correlate with other presenting complaints. You know, sometimes pain would be associated with some bowel bladder disorders. She would also complain of increased frequency of maturation, some altered bowel habits. Or there, there can be an you know onset of precocious puberty. So you have to uh, look into the features in total. Like I'll give you a list of some differential diagnoses in various age groups here. Like in neonates, pain could be because of an UTI, her sprung enterocolitis, incarcerated hernia, induced abscess, Meckel's diverticulum, volvulus. So when you look into these differential diagnoses, some of them are, you know, uh, they have this congenital presentation. They have a very early presentation just during birth. So you have to keep them in mind whenever you see a very young patient presenting with pain. Children, again, UTI is common. Then, you know, slightly higher, like infectious etiology, appendicitis, gastroenteritis, Mesentering adenitis, ovarian pathology, could be constipation, pneumonia. When you move to adolescence, slightly higher age group, all these infectious etiologies can present like appendicitis, diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, some type 1 diabetes, cholecystitis, gastroenteritis, ovarian cysts. Teenage girls can even present with an ectopic pregnancy, so you have to look into their history of any missed cycle, any missed period, hydrosalphings, if they're sexually active, you know, even they can present with pelvic inflammatory disease, renal calculi, UTI. So keep these differential diagnoses in your mind and whenever they present with symptoms, try to correlate with other symptoms and again, the importance of good history taking cannot be replaced by anything else. Investigations. Simplest one and very effective one is pelvic ultrasound. Here in children and adolescents, we have to perform a transabdominal pelvic ultrasound. However, it requires a full bladder to enable visualization of the ovary. Unlike women of reproductive age group, elder women, where we can perform a transvaginal scan because they are married and sexually active. Ultrasound is helpful for differentiating benign and malignant lesions by applying the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Classification. I discussed this in my previous video. If a complex ovarian cyst is diagnosed on an ultrasound scan, MRI of the pelvis can be requested which provides good soft tissue delineation. However, young children often require sedation because of the length of the examination. Other tests would include full blood count, C-reactive protein, which can be raised in presence of ovarian torsion. Not always, sometimes. Tumor markers, we are going to uh, discuss a list of them. Urine dipstick, just to rule out UTI. And when indicated, even endocervical swabs for pelvic infection. If there are any signs of precocious puberty, a hormonal profile should also be performed, which includes FSH, LH, serum estradiol, and thyroid function. This we discussed in previous video also. I'll just quickly go through it. B rules and M rules. B stands for benign and M stands for malignant. Simple. So when there are unilocular cysts, presence of a caustic shadowing, there are solid components, but the, even the largest one is less than 7 mm. Smooth multilocular tumor with largest diameter less than 100 millimeter or 10 centimeter, and there is no blood flow on putting the Doppler. Favor of benign lesion. If it's an irregular solid tumors, presence of ascites, there are at least four papillary structures. Irregular multilocular solid tumor. See there, it was smooth, but here it's irregular multilocular. 
with largest diameter more than 10 centimeter or 100 millimeters and very strong blood flow on Doppler. It goes in favor of malignancy. It's very logical and it's very easy to remember also. Tumor markers, very important from you know your exam point of view also. Alpha fetoprotein. So it is raised in immature teratoma, cytolytic cell tumors, yolk sac tumors, embryonal carcinomas. Human chorionic gonadotrophin or SCG, it is raised in dysgerminoma and embryonal carcinoma. Then there is LDH or lactate dehydrogenase, which is ra again raised in dysgerminoma and immature teratoma. Cancer antigen 125 or CA125. This is very easy to remember. It is raised in epithelial tumors, though there are a lot of benign conditions where you can have slightly raised cancer antigen 125, but it's specifically raised to a greater level in epithelial tumors. CEA or chorionic embryonic antigen is also raised in epithelial tumors. Serum estradiol, juvenile granulosa tumors. It's easy to remember granulosa tumors, they secrete estrogen. So, estradiol is raised in that. Again, sertoliletic tumors, obviously, they, can, they release testosterone, so it will be raised. So, some of them are very easy to remember. Rest, you know, you can make some mnemonic out of it. How do we manage? Most ovarian cysts in children and adolescents can be managed conservatively without any surgical intervention. You know, we should be a little hesitant or we should think a lot before doing any surgical intervention in young children and adolescents. Surgery is indicated in the presence of an acute abdomen with suspicion of torsion or acute appendicitis, you know, some other uh, surgical causes. Persistent ovarian cysts, which are four, 5 to 7 centimeter in diameter, not resolving with conservative management or on various investigations like doing a scan, doing those tumor markers, there is a high degree of suspicion of malignancy. If there is a simple cyst less than 3 centimeter in diameter, there is, you know, there is this large follicle, no further imaging is required. If the cyst is 3 to 5 centimeter in diameter, a repeated scan should be arranged in 3 months to check for resolution. If the cyst is slightly more, that is 5 to 7 centimeter in diameter, or for surveillance ultrasound, in three months or a laparoscopic ovarian cyst or a laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy if it's symptomatic. If a hemorrhagic cyst is identified, offer a further scan, you know, in one and a half to two months, that's six to eight weeks to check for resolution. Most mature cystic teratomas grow very slow at a rate of around one to two millimeters per year. So they can be monitored conservatively. Generally, if a mature cystic teratoma is less than 5 cm in diameter, conservative management with serial scans is advised. So, here we will discuss this management a bit further and then at the end, I will provide you a nice flow chart which is very easy to understand and easy to remember. So, if we have a simple cyst more than 7 cm, we have learned about less than 3 cm, then between 3 to 5, 5 to 7. Now, if we have a cyst more than 7 cm, consider lap laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy or do another scan in 3 months if it is completely asymptomatic and patient is you know willing to have a very close follow up with you. Complex cyst, tumor markers and MRI required. While you know when you get the result of these tumor markers and MRI and there is no suspicion of cancer. If it is symptomatic, size more than 5 cm, laparoscopic intervention. All children and young girls should be followed up after surgery to discuss the findings and the implications on future fertility. You know, it is very important what impact can it have on their reproductive life. If there is a suspicion of cancer, refer to gynecology and oncology MDT. When required, surgery should be laparoscopic. This approach is preferred over an open one and with ovarian conservation whenever possible. Even in cases of ovarian torsion, go for a conservative approach. 
Laparoscopy in children and adolescents requires the surgeon and anesthetist to have knowledge of the various anatomical differences noted in children and adolescents compared with adults. For example, bladder is intraperitoneal in children. So you have to be very careful with suprapubic pods. Fascia is not well developed and prone to pod site herniation. So use very small. You know, use smaller scope, 2 to 5 mm. Use small trochas, close the fascia. If it's 10 mm or more pot size, keep camera in the pot as the umbilical pot is removed to prevent mental evisceration. Avoid vaginal examination and uterine manipulation unless it's very necessary during the procedure. So these are certain, you know, precautions or certain things which you need to keep in mind while doing a laparoscopic surgery. I'm not going in detail because it's beyond the scope of this little video. <laughs> now here is a nice flow chart summarizing the management, presentation and referral of four ovariances. She can just present in your emergency with acute abdomen where you have a strong suspicion of ovarian torsion. Imaging to inform surgery if available within four hours of admission and her clinical condition permits. Laparoscopic surgery wherever possible. Go for an ovarian sparing approach. Request on call gynecologist for inputs. This is the acute condition. You have to manage it immediately. But if she presents like with an incidental finding, no symptoms, there is some pain in abdomen on and off. There can be some associated menstrual problems or precocious puberty symptoms. Go for a trans abdominal ultrasound. And as I said, most of them, like 60% of them are sympasis. So we'll discuss sympasis first. And then you have to manage them according to their size. 3 to 5 centimeter, 5 to 7, more than 7. Less than 3, just reassure. Nothing would happen and you can arrange a follow-up probably. If it's 3 to 5 centimeter, arrange a scan after 3 months for reassurance. If there is a pre girl, then there needs a review in specialist PAG clinic. If it's a simple cyst, 5 to 7 centimeter, it can either be asymptomatic or it can be symptomatic. If it's asymptomatic, you can leave her for a follow-up again in 3 months. If it resolves, well and good. But if it persists or if it's symptomatic in the initial presentation, go for tumor markers and MRI. If it's a simple cyst, more than 7 centimeters. Now, that's a significant size. Laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy is preferred. Or a scan after 3 months can be considered if it's totally asymptomatic and patient and her family is willing for a very close follow-up. Now, this is about simple cyst. What if it is complex cyst on a trans-abdominal ultrasound? Arrange tumor markers and MRI. When you get those results, if the range is within normal limits, MRI seems to be fine, no suspicion of cancer, symptomatic, more than 5 centimeters, consider laparoscopic cystectomy. And if there is a suspicion of cancer, refer to gynecology and oncology multidisciplinary team and then they will manage. All children and young girls should be followed up after surgery. I'm going to repeat myself in this. So as to discuss their findings and implications on future fertility. So that's all in brief about ovarian cysts in young girls and adolescents. I hope you liked our video. If there are any suggestions, I am looking forward to them. Please put in your feedback in the comments below and stay tuned in to Relay Tutorials. Thanks for watching.